Welcome back inside the wardrobe. This really is my wardrobe. All I did was put some acoustic tiles up. If you're watching this in the United States, this is my closet. And I've come to realize that this wardrobe keeps me in the matrix. Let me explain. I used to have a real life and a real job. I worked as a pipe fitter on a construction site, I eventually became an air conditioning engineer. And when I was 27, I was lucky enough to be accepted in the Australian Film, TV and Radio School, which was my gateway into radio. And then I left that school and went out to Two PK Parks, first radio station I worked on. And I've been there ever since, on the radio. The outskirts of showbiz, maybe actual showbiz, who really knows? But I've not had a real job. And it's been wonderful. It's not reality working in radio. A lot of people who've only worked in radio don't realize that, but it's not. It's not the same as having real work. I don't even consider it work, but anyway. And so being in radio is like being in the matrix. It's not reality. It's an illusion. But it's great. And we like it. And up until just before COVID, I, I worked in radio all along for it's like almost 30 years. And then I lost the radio job I had just before COVID and COVID came along and now it's really hard to get back in. But I've managed to get work on the radio and in other forms of audio entertainment. For instance, I, I'm making decent money at the moment reading audio books. I've got four books for sale on Audible right now. I've got three that are finished, ready to go on. And I'm working on five at the moment and they're paying money, cash money, to do the work, which I do from in here. So in here is keeping me in the matrix. Now, when things went horribly wrong, a lot of people tried to help me. And one of them was Paul O'Reilly, who, who I met. He's a great radio presenter who turned into a property developer. And he gave me the phone number of a bloke who could get me a job driving vans if I was stuck. And the phone number is on this piece of paper. And for a while there, you know, every week I'd look at this piece of paper and think, should I call this number? Should I do it? Should I go back to the real world? And as time has gone on, I've realized at the moment, I don't need to make that call. This piece of paper is the red pill that gets me out of the matrix and back to the real world. But if I go there, I don't know if I'll come back. And I really like the fantasy of the matrix. So thank you, wardrobe, for keeping me inside this unreal world I like so much. Now, one of the things that's been so great about being in the matrix is getting to meet other people in the matrix because there are some amazing people and one of them is BJ Shea I met him at a radio conference and we've stayed friends ever since every time I go to one of these conferences in the States BJ seems to be there and we hang out and he's an amazing kid not only is he a first-rate broadcaster and a top-class entertainer. He's also, he's a deep thinker. And he's a very, very caring bloke. Deep down, and he'd probably, I don't know if he'd like me saying, but deep down, I think he's quite a gentle bloke, a very, very sensitive bloke. Which you might think is unusual for a bloke who does a breakfast show on a rock station in Seattle. He's been very, very successful there. And, you know, in the U.S., they talk about competitive markets, New York, L.A., Chicago, Seattle. You know, for years, Seattle had the powerhouse of the Bob Rivers show. You might be familiar with the Twisted Tunes. Have you ever heard a parody song on the radio? It's more than likely one of Bob's. At Christmas in this country, they still play Chipmunks Roasting on an Open Fire, 
walking around in women's underwear. That's Bob Rivers. Bob was in Seattle for a long, 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 long time. Currently, Danny Bonaducci, who you might remember from the Partridge family, Danny from the Partridge family. Danny Bonaducci is on the air in Seattle. And a guy that's beaten them both consistently is BJ Shea. I'm proud to call him my friend because I think he is a very, very interesting guy. He's a very, very entertaining guy. And this is the chat I had with him. And we cover all sorts of things, like at the time when he got the Seattle job, because that's not his hometown. Uh, he was in a bit of a, a radio wilderness and he was helped out by good people and he got into that gig and it's just been great ever since. One of the things about him that I, I didn't mention in our chat, he had a producer called Miggs and Miggs became such a big part of the show. BJ made the radio station change the name of the show to BJ and Miggs. He shared billing. Generosity like that is not commonplace inside the Matrix. Here he is. It's my chat with BJ Shea. Uh, I'm how are think, you? I'm very good. I'm trying to think about the uh, the last time you and I were together in person. Do you know it's it was 2012? Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, it was the uh, the talk show boot camp in New Orleans was the last oh. time you and I were together in the same room. Oh, yeah, I haven't. And, and that might be the last time I did a talk show boot camp. I don't do those anymore. I'll, I, I'll go to the morning show ones, but not the talk show ones anymore. It's I don't really do much of a talk show anymore, I guess. So it, I really wasn't getting a whole lot out of it. And uh, and honestly, my attitude was pretty negative listening to some of the philosophy thrown my way. I think now, uh, um, uh, upon further reflection, it had more to do with me than them. Um, yeah, but that's I think that might have been the last time I went. Really? Yeah, I yeah. was there. I was invited there. I was on a panel. I was on a panel called The Rising Rising Stars, mm. the show that have talk radio buzzing. Um, I think I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my my memory of that was. I think it was the second night you and I went out to dinner with a New Zealander. And to my great shame, I can't remember his first name. His last name was Van Dyke, and he was programming a talk station in New Zealand. Remember him? I believe I do. Yeah. Uh, but I and can't remember his first name either. We, we got to the end of the meal, and you said, well, do you want to hit the strip clubs now? And I said, <laughs> I said that's not really my thing. Oh, uh, well... And, and this guy from New Zealand said, have you ever been to a strip club with, with BJ? I said, no, I've never been to a strip club. I said, it's just not my thing. And he says, oh, no, he, he, we were there last night and BJ made the stripper cry. Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds like my <laughs> MO. I, uh, I end up having more of a father-daughter. Well, I don't know if I was, the, well, it could have been a father-daughter moment. And then they, you know, it gets more like a therapy session, uh, which I don't know if that's good for either one of us, really, but... <laughs> Well, what was it tipped her over the edge? Oh, my gosh. First of all, you're asking me to remember eight years ago. Okay, okay. Yeah, sure. uh, eight minutes ago, I'll tell you right now, it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> but I feel probably, uh, you know, it could have been a personal issue. Somehow, some way I had, I just had this way of seeing into people. I felt, here's my thing about going to, and I haven't been, I, that might have been the last time I went to a strip club. I can't remember the last time I was at one. Um, but I felt bad just observing without like making a connection without knowing it's like i i just felt like i want to give something back and then but the trouble is is it usually goes a little too deep trying to get to know her and next thing you know she's in tears talking about a family member she doesn't get along with uh and and, and that 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 sort of has been my interaction with a lot of a lot of people mostly women when i would talk with them i, I would get a little I guess I would get a little too non-surface. I don't make small talk very well. I really <laughs> go right, I go right for the gusto. I just go, and next thing you know, water works everywhere. Um, and I did get a bit of a reputation, like, oh, you've got to go to a, you got to go anywhere with him. It's not a typical moment. Uh, not too many people can, you know, you can get a stripper angry by not paying her or insulting her, but making a stripper cry, that's a, and you know, that's a whole different level. Than, <laughs> Probably. That's what makes you unique, BJ. That's is what, that what it is. Yeah, it was one of the things, one of the many things. 
that makes well, I will say this. I mean, one moment you're talking with Alan Alda about how unique he is, mm -hmm. and then you're talking with me about my own uniqueness. <laughs> I just don't feel like that's a fair exchange for you. <laughs> I, I, I do. Really I do. Everybody who is who I because I select the guests. And everyone I select as a guest for the Zoomcast, which also becomes a guest on multiple weeks on the Pod 20 on Podcast Radio, I select them. So I see you all on the same level. So you're there. You're there. You're a kind man. Trust me, you're BJ. Alan Alda, Alan Alda is right up there with BJ Shea. Yeah. You know, I, I hope someday he gets there. I really do. <laughs> you know, that, that kid's got talent. Um, uh, yeah, he's, uh, uh, you know, it's wonderful to see somebody like Alan Alda, what I've noticed about people who have achieved the success that he's achieved is that there is a humility, there's a kindness. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. nice to see Yeah. because I don't know if I always believed that was there. It's like, oh, somebody like him, oh, he's got to be a this and that, you know, he's he's got to be an expletive deleted. And it's so wonderful to see moments uh, from humans like that, that had have achieved whatever he's achieved and just see in a level of peace and a level, I thought he was really kind with you. And mm. oh, he was lovely. Uh, yeah. Which is when you think about it, you know how what it is to be an interviewer. I, I don't care who you are. Somehow, some way interviewers are just looked at sometimes like you are the enemy. I don't care if you want, I don't care if you're promoting my movie, you're <laughs> the enemy. <laughs> yeah. So, so he was, uh, yeah, he was great. How long have you been hosting BJ and Miggs mornings on KISW in Seattle now then? Because you were already there in 2012. You were already at uh, Yes, uh, we, started, we started in 2006. Wow. Um, which I was told, I was at the ripe age of 46. I was told, that's a little old to be starting hosting a show. You better get it right because this is your last opportunity. And that was... Uh, uh, and that was really the motivation that I needed. That was that positivity that really just... <laughs> Doesn't radio me. really look after talent? Doesn't radio yeah. really know how to stroke delicate people? Yeah. I do feel like the uh, nurturers somehow found other professions to really get to. <laughs> and, and somehow radio somehow just got missed. We just got avoided or something. Um, but yeah, since 06. Wow. And for yeah. anyone who doesn't know, tell us about the show. So uh, the show has had a lot of different uh, sort of transformations over the years. Currently, uh, we work on a, mu a station that plays rock music. And it's, you know, you'll, you'll hear some new stuff from time to time, but we'll go all the way back to Led Zeppelin. We'll throw in Nirvana. We'll throw in uh, a, a, a Disturbed. It, uh, it's really mainstream rock. Uh, every once in a while, some Imagine Dragons will show up as well. And uh, that's the music of the station. And we'll play three or four songs an hour. And then in between that, we will do pop culture, really fun, not politically leaning at all type of material targeted towards a 35 year old man, but a 35 year old Seattle man, which is so different than a 35 year old Cleveland man or a 35 year old Boston man. Uh, so that's, that's something that I don't think really is recognized enough in our business, Graham, is that you can have a demographic, but then there's this regional culture that you have to respect uh, that, at least in our country anyway, because it's so big, um, that we would not, I don't know if we'd be considered a rock show in Cleveland. You know, we might be considered more of a lighter fair show that, you know, that, that maybe women would like, which is so interesting about just, to, you know, depending on where you travel in the U.S. and their sensibilities. Mm. Now, you talk about the pressure of starting a new show. You replaced Howard Stern. Yes, I did. And wow. you know what? He's never come back. We showed him. <laughs> What's ever become of that guy? <laughs> yeah. He went on some weird spacey thing or something, didn't he? Yeah, he yeah. sure did. And then he hosted this America's Got Talent for a while. And I, that didn't. What did that do for him? <laughs> That poor guy never catches a break. But the ratings went up after you replaced Howard. So what was the trick there? Because you'd think, you know, it's it's a it's a it was a station aimed still is a station aimed as you said at, at guys. You would think Howard Stern would get all the guys he could, and then you went in and got even more. He did really well too. Uh, Howard did. Howard's a great 
talent. So, uh, you know, if you don't have a local show, which at the time our station didn't have, they, they, you know, they said, well, let's plug them in. I mean, we, I don't know if we could do better than trying to wait years to get a local show. And that's what they did. And he did very well for our station. Uh, when he left, we had already been doing a midday show. So we had a nice following. Uh, people, I think, would listen to Howard in the morning, come and listen to us on a different station where we did middays. And so when he left, that was the company said, hey, you guys are probably the best alternative we have. And so they moved us, since the company owned both radio stations, they moved us from this midday show and had us as Howard's replacement. And the secret, Graham, is the secret to knowing our audience because Seattle's a very friendly place and it's very courteous. If you're discourteous in our city, you know, when you think about sometimes how the U.S. is, is you know, seen, especially if, you know, you maybe follow certain politics, we might seem very rude. Uh, and being from Boston, I know for a fact, you know, Boston, we pride ourselves on being very rude, <laughs> it, it, though we don't think so, but really, you know, when New Yorkers think you're a jerk, you gotta, you, at some point, you gotta look at yourself. <laughs> Seattle is that polar opposite where courtesy is king. So we knew that if we went on the air and badmouthed Howard, which a lot of shows tried to do, they tried to make him a bad guy when he left for satellite, we took a different alternative. We, 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 we actually opened up the phone lines and said, look, we know you're gonna miss the guy. How, I mean, you're, you were his fans. You know, we're sorry that he's gone calling. Let's talk about it. And so really we turned it into sort of a kumbaya thing which a lot of my peers thought I was crazy to do, but that I think really was the key. It worked out very well. My, my program director was all on board with it. So we were really kind and embracing, and that seemed to work. The folks that were like, all right, well, Howard's gone, but you seem nice, you know, it was, yeah. and in Seattle, that's a big thing. It really is a big thing. Courtesy is king. You can be blunt, you can be direct, you can even almost really be negative towards somebody, as long as you do it with a please and thank you. <laughs> it's interesting as well, for those who don't know the market at all, it's a very competitive market. You had you had other big competitors. I mean, uh, the Bob yeah. River show was on at the time, wasn't it? Which was a huge show. Yeah. And that was a that was, male skewed audience too. Yeah, and he and Bob Rivers, you know, he's he's retired now. Had a gigantically successful career, and Seattle was one of the places he was that he was really great in. Um, ironically, coincidentally, I don't know the quite word. We should ask Alanis, Alanis Morissette about what ironic means. But the idea that he brought me to town, and I run, I'll never forget this, Graham. He was my friend for many years. Saw him at all those conventions. He brought me to Seattle. He recommended that I get the job to do middays. And then he left the company and worked for the competing company in Seattle. And I remember him saying this when he first brought me to town. He goes, I'm going to bring you to town because you're a good guy. You need a break. I think I can learn from you. But I know that you're going to beat me in the rating someday. But I'm going to still bring you to town anyway. But at the time, Graham, I had no job. I couldn't get a job. And when I got hired there, it was midday. So I thought he was insane. I go, what do you mean I'm going to beat you in the ratings? You're this big morning show. I, I can't even get a job in this business. And uh, many years later, lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. He, he called me up and he said, hey, uh, why did I get you this job? As I had <laughs> gone to number one and beat him in the ratings. Um, but a man, I, I couldn't have believed in that moment, well, if he really knew that would be true, which it ended up being true, that he was still gracious enough to give me this opportunity, knowing that I would supplant him, which yeah. I don't, I would like to think that yeah. I would be kind enough to do so, but I don't think I'm at Alan Alda status. I don't think I would, I, don't, I probably would just step on that poor person and go, yeah, sorry you're out of a job and you're not coming here. No way, buddy, that's not happening. And when you say you were out of a job, you were out of a job because you'd just been fired for doing something naughty, right? Um, you know, I've been fired so many times. You, you're gonna have to be more specific. Um, well, <laughs> this is the thing. I think what you're referring to is when I got the job that Bob got me and then I got fired. So I was only here for four months. Bob recommended me and then I got fired and that made Bob look really bad. Um, but I was before coming to what was Seattle. It you, did? You, you did something, didn't you? You didn't just get, yes, people get fired. I, um, and I, 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 there was a, there was a wonderful program uh, on one of, uh, on HBO and uh, the Christians, uh, it was an LGBTQ plus program. Uh, it was uh, Chloe Savini and um, 
why do I always forget this woman's name? She was in Million Dollar Baby, a uh, great actress. And anyway, they had this, uh, well, Boys Don't Cry, I think was the name of the, 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 the movie. And well, Christians were up in arms. And so I was very, very just mean and said angry things, could have said them a lot better towards Christians. That raised the ire of some people in the community, much to the point that they petitioned me gone. Uh, and it, uh, it worked, sort of. Um, I was gone for a short time, but I also petitioned myself back with the company, said, hey, look, you know, how about you give a kid a chance? Um, <laughs> you know, and I'll be nicer to the Christians this time. Um, and I think because of the fact that Seattle is the most underchurched city in our country, for the most part, at least it was back then, that eventually the company realized, maybe it was really a very small amount of voices. And when they listened to the whole show, they realized I was championing, I was really championing the LGBT plus community, which of course is really big in Seattle. And yeah. so they were like, yeah, maybe we should, we should probably, maybe we're on the wrong side of this after all, maybe we should bring him back. Cause he was actually championing a very, you know, loved and respected community. And so I got the job back. Yeah. So uh, that was, that was fortunate. That's so my agent how long, recommended. No, no, <laughs> boys and girls. Yeah. Um, so how long have you lived in, in Seattle now, Seattle, Washington? Uh, celebrated my 20th year uh, this past November. So you'd know the city quite well. One thing I always find interesting, I've been to Seattle and it's a lovely city. It's great. Is that it is, as you say, polite and there's nice people. And, but when it comes to protests and riots, you do like a rumble. You know, Graham, I don't that? know. I don't know what's going on. There are people that really believe that there is this small section of, of just troublemakers that will go where there's a large crowd and make it look like that the crowd is the, is the reason for the, the problems. And having been here, um, what's really sad about these protests is that they really, really were very well done. And the leaders of these protests were actually very articulate, very friendly. It, what, at one point, they were sharing a stage with our mayor. And the mayor was, everybody was really reasonable in the midst of this social chaos that was going on. And it's sad that, you know, you know how news is, if it leads, it bleeds. They would focus on this group of people whom I'm not really sure were caring at all about what was going on. I think that if we had won the World Series with our baseball team, those same group of people would come and break windows and ruin things. I, I, and that, that's really been what folks have thought is that, I don't think this is the protesters because I would say 99% of the protesters were very peaceful, very reasonable. And I mean, their message is an important message. So I, I, I don't think that they would want to really mar it with really criminal and violent behavior because that would mitigate what they're trying to say, which is pay attention to the message. We don't want you to pay attention to the broken windows. The message is more important than that. Um, and I, so I believe that it's not Seattleites. I, and some people don't even think they're from here. A lot of these folks that come wearing their masks, causing problems. I believe they just want people to be afraid. Whoever this small group of people is, is you know, human beings, if you're afraid, then you can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. And I believe whatever, I don't know what their, you know, I don't know what their agenda is, but their agenda is not the same agenda for the folks that want social change. I know that because that's just not what you do, you know, and that's what 99, and 99% and of the folks involved in that didn't do that. And it's unfortunate that Seattle looks the way it looks, and especially when different news organizations were posting fake pictures and even pictures from other cities claiming, uh, you know, oh, hey, this is what's going on in Seattle. And my, my relatives are like, oh, my God, it's a war zone. I'm like, that picture's from Minnesota. Don't even believe that. That's not even us. Yeah. And then Fox, Fox News had to come out and say, whoops, sorry. Did we do that? It doesn't help when the big one, I mean, it's a long time ago now, the one around about 2000 is referred to as the Battle of Seattle. Mm. I mean, that mm. doesn't help. And then didn't you have a police chief and you have a large protest outside her residence the other night? Yes, um, and that's on which is unfortunate because I feel like she's been very reasonable. Um, very, very reasonable. You know, again, from my position, I, I really, you know, I have, I, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know at all. I mean, I live my life, who am I? But I feel like the police chief has been very reasonable 
and the mayor has been very reasonable. Uh, and yet it, you know, depending upon whom you talk to, I think everybody's a little, I think everybody's just a little up on the, uh, anxiety level uh and how do you handle that of, on the air do you do you reflect it the way you just did then saying it's these these are not the real people with the issue these are just a, a handful of troublemakers it's just an interesting thing because my job you know is 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 to take the company edict whatever and and, and they know what they want the station to be and they know what they want this you know what to be broadcast out of their speakers and we have probably as many people who are for one issue, we have as many people who are also against that issue. We're 50-50 split when it comes to our listeners. So, so like Graham, what do, you, <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, what do you do yeah. when you know that, you know, you've got red state, blue state? It's really insane. The numbers are crazy when we take a look at the, the stats. 50% of the people are conservative, 50% of the people are, are, are liberal. And yet they like us, which I think is great. That's yeah. to me, I look at it like, boy, wouldn't it be great if the country was like this, that everybody could agree on one thing uh, like they agree on our show. So that does put us in a difficult position. No matter what I say, if I take a side, I'm going to irritate 50% yeah. of the audience. Yeah. So I walk a line of, it's my line is I, I don't believe any politician. I don't like the system. I don't like politics. I don't like that these representatives are, are skillionaires. That wasn't what it was meant to be in our country. It's supposed to be the average Joe doing the work for the average Joe. And that's not what it is. And I am not going to be fooled by putting a letter on my chest saying, I'm on this team, so I know we're in good shape. I really will not fall for that. I am a person that wants to do the best for the people. And whoever I believe will do that, I don't care what party you're with. I don't care what you're doing. If I believe you're doing the best for the people, then you got my vote. And right now, there's not a lot of people in my country who I think are doing the best for the people. And it saddens me. So I, I take that approach, Graham. And that way, if they, if they can all be wanting to, to be mad, but I'm not saying they're bad, they're, their person's bad. I'm saying, look, I think they're all really kind of, in cahoots and there may be some good people splintered here and there but what could they do in a system that's just, you know that basically is systemically corrupt how do you how do you take your soul if you're a good politician and operate in a system that might be just massively corrupt i don't know yeah well seattle is very different it was the first, washington state was the first u.s state to legalize recreational use of marijuana how has that worked out Depending on who you talk to, uh, we get a lot more people coming to this fine state of ours because it isn't prose is prosecuted as harshly. Some of the folks that come here may not uh, may be putting a strain on the system because they they might they, they might just not want to do anything but just sort of live in a tent. That's been the thing that people are upset about. And at the other and at the other side of it though is that there's a lot of great medicinal uses that uh, recreational use or even medicinal use of marijuana has done to, you know, to benefit people as well as create business. But it's one of those, you know, it's one of those things that if you, if you lean one way or you lean another way, you're going to feel that way about it. I mean, which is life, you know, Graham, it's like, if I have this attitude of whatever, that's how I'm going to see everything. You know, it's like, if I'm Mr. Negative, everything <laughs> is horrible. I hate everything. Um, I think for the most part, it's been good. I, re I really do because I just don't see why we should legislate against something like this. I think our money is better well spent, perhaps finding other things. And really, if we can do anything to do something about the mental health issues that our country faces, which I think is responsible for any problem we ever have. Uh, it, you know, I think it's either alcohol, drugs, not on your medicine, or should be on medicine. I, I think that is the response. I think that you could look at it, any crime that's ever committed and those, one of those four reasons are it. And that's a mental health issue. Rather than throwing somebody in a prison, how about we get people some help? Yeah. And I don't know why that isn't the rallying cry of every politician in our country, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. So it's usually about the money. And you could be cynical and say that the, the, the legalization of it in Washington State was to do with money, was to do with making money. So well, yeah. it could well be. It could well be. But green for the green, my friend. <laughs> you want that green? Since you got to sell that green. Tell me about the podcast then, BJ Shea's Geek Nation. Well, um, 
I have to say that uh, it is a labor of love, a passion of love. I am a huge, huge geek. Um, it, I did everything to not have my Star Trek Enterprise bridge background. I thought, well, you know, I, 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 but I, believe me, it was, it was, I, I did think about putting it there. Um, yes, I, uh, uh, I'm a, a huge geek. And when I was asked to do a podcast eight years ago, I said, well, I'm going to do about something I love that I don't get to talk about that much on my main show. And um, it's turned into a really fun enterprise that I use now mostly to promote other people's work, whether it be anything, whatever they're doing, it could be movies, television, writing, uh, video games, board games, uh, tech. And, and we like to give an opportunity for people to, who are trying to make a living in those worlds and they're fledgling is that, well, maybe our podcast can let pe more people know about it. And wouldn't that be great if this could be your full-time job? Since I get to do this as my full-time job, it's sort of a way of paying it forward. Um, as well as maybe talking about all my favorite stuff and talking about all the board games I like to play. And um, you have a wonderful uh, group of folks out there. Um, Matt Quinn and uh, I think it's Paul from Shut Up and Sit Down, uh, which, is a, which is an internet board game uh, video series that they've done for years. And, um, and they just, because of how they bring the British to it, if, as, as an American, it's the best way I could say it, I find it so enjoyable on how they tell, teach me how to play a board game. And yet at the same time, it is a full production, uh, very talented people. And so uh, I want, you know, let me make sure I've got their names right. Just because it's called, uh, yeah, yeah, Quentin, excuse me, Quentin, Matt and Paul and um, shut up and sit down. Uh, and it's, they're brilliant. It's just brilliant, brilliant people. And, you know, that's how deep the rabbit hole goes with the, we can do this geek podcast because yeah. there's so much out there that nobody knows about. Um, these guys make a living doing that. They just do these YouTube videos and they hope that people will pay them Patreon or whatever. And they hold conventions and, um, and they're not the only ones. There's so many more. Um, but you know that, you know, you know, Graham, you know that if now the world is such a big place that if you, if you are into one thing, somebody else will make a video and probably make a buck off of it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it becomes a community and a, a tribe. That's, that's kind of how it is. Yeah. yeah. And you also get to, to review, you, you also get to, an excuse to watch your favorite TV shows as well, because it's work now as well. I know you're a Whovian. Um, oh gosh, yes, yeah. Uh, how's how's she doing? How's the new doctor doing? I I've got to admit I haven't seen any of the new ones since Jodie's taken over, and I didn't see well, that many before to be fair. But I haven't seen any of the ones she's done. Yeah, Jodie's. Well, first of all, Jodie's a terrific actor. Uh, as soon as I heard she was getting the role, because of what she's done before, I thought, okay. Uh, you know, my concern was, and and only because of the fact when people pay too much fan service, I thought. Are they going to change the character? Because the doctor is not very likable. He's mm -hmm. also not exactly s empathetic. He's always stumbled around humans. And that's been the, the charm of the doctor is that he stumbles around humans and doesn't quite get it right, even though he comes from a superior race with great technology, the ability to travel through time and space. But really, the empathy and even understanding how to be with people's never been the doctor's strong suit. Yeah. And he's come off like an idiot sometimes and has to has usually gets chastised by the the human companions so i thought oh is that going to be something that people are going to tolerate from a from a being done to a female actor i thought I, you know i wasn't sure how this was going to be were they going to try to make this be like a super doctor because well we don't want this woman to be treated badly because that would be what the fans might say. And I'm like, I just want the doctor to be the doctor. And my gosh, Jody's knocked it out of the park. She is my favorite doctor. She is as really? awkward. Wow. She's terrifically who? And I mean, look, you know, Graham, there's no, there's, uh, I will say this, the, the, it's no uh, secret. The ratings I know have not been great in England. And I'm, I don't know if they've been great here compared to previous iterations of Doctor Who. And it saddens me because I see the complaints online and honestly, Graham, I don't know anything else but because of the fact that deep down, the real reason is because she's a woman. And they, and they think, oh my gosh, you should never have cast a woman in this role. You think that's what it, it is? I do, because everything else they say makes no sense. She is a brilliant actress. And, and, and anybody would tell you that long before she got this role. So it's not because Jodie can't act. 
the writing and the and the cast around her there they, and you would know better than me i mean because i don't know much of their work except what i've read that they're just terrifically heralded as great actors the people along with her so the writing is good i mean i go back and watch all the other episodes and you know, we, you and I were maybe remember the the 70s ones where, right, my God, I mean. The wobbly you know, scenery, yeah. Oh, and also the fact we have to kill 20 minutes, so Sarah Jane is going to trip and fall again, and for 10 <laughs> minutes we'll drag her through the jungle because we have to fill 20 minutes. Uh, so you can't say the writing is worse because it's not. Um, and Chris Chibnall's not, it's, I mean, he's a very good showrunner, you know, and so... I don't know what else to call it, except it's a bunch of older, white, cisgendered men that just don't want to get over the fact that they've taken the character who used to reflect them. Oh, that's me. I can point to me. There's a white guy being the hero. And now here is a woman who's the hero who doesn't look like them. And now they know what it feels like to have to watch a show where that's not them on the screen and they don't like it. Yeah. And they don't know they don't like it. And so I think it's subconscious that they find anything to nitpick. But I think it's because that's a woman up there playing the role that you're used to being a man. Wow. That's the only thing I can think of because the show I think is terrific. I've loved it. I, I don't know what they're complaining about. I, and I think this season was better than last season. And, I, and, and I'm not kidding. She's my favorite doctor. And I, I love Tennant and I love Matt Smith and I love Tom Baker. I, I'm really, I, I loved a lot of the doctors. So it's not as if, you know, this is a bandwagon thing. She's that good. I really look at her and I go, and I just go, oh my gosh, Jody, you are nailing this. It's, it, and, <laughs> and, and, and so I'm, I, I hope she feels that love. I hope that enough people let her know that because, uh, and it's just, and also as a performer, she's terrific anyway. I mean, I, I mean, I just, I look at her and I go, if I could be a quarter of good, as good at her, at my job as she is at her job, I might be somebody. That's how good, that's how good Jody is in the role. And um, my gosh, I can't remember the gentleman's name was playing the master. Uh, Sa Sasha, oh my, I'm horrible. Um, he's a terrific master. I mean, they, they, they've done a great job. They really have. I, um, so yes, I love it a lot. Um, it's, it's, I, I like that you, you've you said that she's a great actress because at one of the conventions I saw you at, I think it was a morning show one, you actually compared, you, you said you approached your version of radio presenting as if you are an actor. That was, yes. can you just talk us through that a little bit? Because that's not every DJ or radio announcer or host approaches it that way, I don't think. No, they don't, Graham. And I, I think that's on our industry because we don't have casting directors. If you look at all the other great performing arts out there, movies, television, plays, uh, there, there are casting directors. Our business doesn't have it. Our business says, they'll go to the perhaps the director and say would you cast this and you know in the mo in the movie business a director might think they should, oh i know who's perfect for this and sometimes they'll even have input but a lot of times if it's a well-run production they will get that casting director involved because they just have that eye that sometimes a director doesn't have um and i and and, and i love that you especially and i love that because i studied that watching a lot of behind the scenes with different movies that i've enjoyed and uh including with doctor who because uh, I remember that um, one of the directors had said about Matt Smith, um, it, he had said that, you know, I created the character how I thought it was going to be. And then probably by episode three or four, Matt was telling me how the character was going to be. And if you get a good actor, that will happen. You will lose your baby, but they will make it better than you ever expected. And that's the sign of a great director that will let the character go and a great actor that will take the character further than any writer and director ever would have imagined. Um, and I, I've taken that to heart and realized this is a performing art. I mean, for crying out loud, Graham, we are the, we are the medium that convinced this country that we were being invaded by Martians. The great <laughs> Orson Welles convinced people in this country that Martians were coming to earth. Radio did that. And I feel like, yes, in a way, we've lost our way because radio still can be that. And that's why I approach it as an actor. I'm a performer. I'm not some big mouth that wants my opinion out there and nobody will listen to me. So I'm going to use this as a giant soapbox to put forth some agenda when in reality, reality I should be in a therapist's office talking <laughs> and rather than talking to a bunch of people. Um, I view this as a performance and as an art at its core, 
I hope that my performance elicits a reaction in the person who's listening to my art and that it catalyzes some kind of growth in the positive direction for them. That's what I hope. But I hope you have a reaction. Love it, hate it, that's cool. If you're neutral to what I do, I'm like, oh, I gotta be better. I mean, I mean you, there's gotta be something. I want you to have some reaction. And loving or hating it is, it, that either one is good for me because that means you've had, you've had an experience with it, like any artist wants you to have. And, they want, and, and I want it to be individual. I don't wanna tell you the kind of interaction you should have with my show. I hope it's unique to you as it is to the next person. And that's art. And that's why I, I come at it like uh, an actor, because that's really what I am. If I'm, so do you if go, I'm really good. Do you go to the program director and do you say to them, well, how do you want this to come across? And then adjust your performance accordingly then in the same way? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They, they have what they call the filter yeah. and they'll say, our filter is, this is our target audience. The filter is we want you to be fun or we don't want you to be political. We don't want you to be anti this. We, and, and then we'll sit down and, okay, define our characters and have a meeting and say, okay, what's my character? And then everybody on the show, we define their characters based, loosely based on oneself. It's yeah, easier, so you're, not right? play, you're not playing somebody play. you're not. You, you're playing yourself. Exactly. A, a certain exaggerated part of your own personality. Yes. And sometimes I will accentuate certain parts of my personality and, uh, and then I will basically just bury some of the other ones that they don't fit within the filter. And then if for, so, so I'm not as argumentative when I was working on a previous show, they wanted this argumentative guys guy and, you know, women were the enemy all about us men. And, you know, and I had just come from an all female radio station that was, you know, playing the hits. So I thought, okay, this will be interesting. Can I pull this off? Um, but there was a part of my personality that I could tap into, you know, that tribal brotherhood, you know, <laughs> you know, those women don't know anything we know best. And, and so I did that for like for the first uh, five or six years while I was in Seattle. Then when they moved me to the rock station, they brought me and said, so, yes, we still target men, but we love women here, too. <laughs> so we really don't we don't want this us versus them mentality. And we also don't want you to get heavy political where I was a little bit more so on the previous show, but I was able to make that adjustment because it's like, all right, um, I can be fun and I can, you know, I, I, I can do all of that. So I would tone down what they didn't want and tone up what they wanted um, because I knew me and I also knew the character. Um, I'm much more, you know, I, there was a, um, there's a great, inside the actor's studio was the program by James Lipton. And I loved mm -hmm. when he brought actors on and he would ask them questions of them, the person, and then of them, the character they play on television. And I would watch that, Graham, and it was such a wonderful study to see, all of a sudden, it was like almost like a split personality. I was like, whoa, because I believe both of the answers, and yet yeah. they were completely different. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I want to be that good. I and, want and people to believe. What is the difference then between BJ Shea, the bloke that I know, and BJ Shea, the radio performer? Oh, that's a good question. Have, do you feel like we've ever had any like sort of off air conversations? I'd like to believe that when I'm just hanging with you, yeah, um, that I'm just hanging with you. Yeah, you Whereas are. on, and then when you listen to the show on air, then you'll hear BJ Shea. Mm. I think that's the best way I could put it because if we worked on the air together, I think you would definitely know a difference because you'd be like, oh, okay, this is how you would answer this question because I've asked you on air. Yeah. Um, but if you were like, like we're doing this interview. Yeah. Um, I suppose you could ask me any question if you'd like, and I could answer it both ways. That's the best way I could demonstrate. I think if you want a real demonstration, if you, you can ask one question about anything and I will tell you what I think as opposed to what BJ Shea on the air thinks is probably, because I think I've always just been me around you because we've never been on air together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you have a question. I, 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 put, I put you in the hot seat, didn't I? Yeah, I, you know, I'm supposed to ask the questions, BJ, but okay. So we want, uh... <laughs> well, sorry. We... sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stay away from politics. And, well, um... no, well, here, you, here you can. You can ask me anything here. I can ask you uh, anything here. Team. Okay. Anything you want, well, yeah. Well, yeah. well tell I mean, me, okay, okay. I'll ask for you, give me your opinion of Donald Trump. First as BJ Shea, the BJ I know to hang with, and the BJ the presenter. 
How, how would the two answer that question? Give me your honest, because I, I want it to be honest, opinion of Donald Trump. Yes. Uh, my honest opinion of, of Donald Trump is that, um, and, I, and, and, I, and I'll pull this from a book that I read. Uh, now, the, am I talking to BJ like now, or am I talking to host of BJ and Mix? Well, if I remember you, I think you wanted me to give you the me that you know. Yes, yes, and I do. BJ and Migs after. So I'm giving okay. you up. I okay. Just to make it clear to anyone who's not okay. following at home. But yeah. What I will do, I promise you this, and, and my best Patrick Stewart, I will, I will get up and I will give you one of these. Oh, I just actually transported. Um, <laughs> but I will, and my best Patrick Stewart, I will let you know when I'm acting. Okay, uh, okay. This is, yeah, this is me. What I find... Um, what I find disturbing is that, and in, in, in not just with Donald Trump, because I just don't believe one person is to blame for the state of anything. It's just, I, I will not fall for that. But what I do notice is the languaging that I'm hearing coming out of the top spot is, is disturbing to me because I read in, in this book called Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown, and she's just brilliant when she talks about how we interact with each other and, and, and how to be good humans. There is languaging coming from the top spot in my country that is dehumanizing. And that scares me because dehumanizing language is a gateway to some really nasty things. And you can just look back in history. When you're calling human beings dogs and when you are taking human beings and putting them on a different level than yourself, that never leads to anything good. Mm -hmm. And that disturbs me. It disturbs me that all of the leaders in our country are tolerating this because, I mean, it's not that long ago that human beings who were called dogs were then later treated horrifically by a leader mm. and, and many leaders in our history. And I'm not saying that our president is that bad, but that languaging is a gateway and I'm always on alert. I want to be, I want to be on alert and say, wait a second. And, and Brene Brown is the one that hit me to it in her book. So it is very concerning. That is my opinion, is that I do not need that out of the top spot of my country's representatives. That bothers the heck out of me. And I wish that would change because humans do not need to treat other humans in that way. It just does not need to happen, especially in 2020. Uh, I can't believe 60 years later, I'm still hearing that kind of language from time to time, calling yeah. another human being a dog. Yeah. You know, Graham, that's, that's just disturbing. And a follow-up question while I'm still talking to you rather than... Yes, the host, yes. Do the media need to do a better job of calling him on it? I think in the, in the last... I only think it's been in the last couple of weeks there's, there's been, there was a great HBO interview with him, and, and it, recently, it's been very recent, he's been allowed to get up for me. I think he's been allowed to get away with it too long. What's your view on, on how US media has been dealing with him? I've always said this before about the US media. If they are running commercials, you're never going to get the truth. They, because they have to, I, I think, I, you know, I don't know, you would know the BBC better than myself, but because they're not commercial, I think you have a better chance of getting the truth because no one is sponsoring it. If I'm understanding what the BBC is. Yeah. The BBC, it's commercial. the BBC has always been accused of having a, a liberal bias, but, 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 yes. not, but definitely not a political position, but it's only ever been accused of, they've never admitted it. So uh, yeah. Well, even, even our, our, our media's bias could very well be based on advertising. That's my point is if somebody is running commercials during your, anything i suspect that well what if you know somebody who runs the giant company whose commercials you're running wants you to approach news in a certain way and they're spending millions of dollars keeping your agency going who's to say that can't happen that's why i don't like where the media has gone and and it's definitely there's been an erosion of quality of all of our media over the last few decades anyway so this is a problem that now has come to light but then again this is the beautiful thing about president trump you don't get to be where he is and operate the way he does unless you were allowed to and we've seen this happening in the world of politics anyway if anything donald trump has shown us how ugly politics are and he's not trying to hide it 
And whereas you might get this smooth talking politician that sounds nice and sounds sweet, but if he's behaving the way that President Trump is behaving, whether you like it or not, at least Trump is telling you, here's what you're getting, baby. Whereas <laughs> other politicians were doing the same thing, but would smooth you over and smile. And I have a great appreciation for what this president is doing for that reason. He is showing us what politics in our country really is really all about, which I've always suspected. Mm. It's ugly. Mm. And they are just horrific with the way they are running our country. And it's all based on money. What else could it be based on? Maybe fear as well. I always believe that when you get a fearful leader, oh my God, it's probably the worst thing ever. And you and I probably know the history of leaders that needed mental help mm -hmm. <laughs> and were overrun with fear and the things they do because they're that afraid. Uh, and there are plenty of stories, especially in the world of sci-fi, that tell you about that. Um, so our media, I will say that I've known some people that are doing a good job trying to get their voice out there. But Graham, whatever the, the agenda has been, the hashtag fake news has done a great job because nobody knows what to believe anymore. Mm. Um, and that is because we've allowed ourselves to be inundated with information because we can't put our cell phones down. Uh, we have overloaded our brains. Um, there's a wonderful book called Bright Line Eating, which is actually a diet book. But uh, this researcher found out that we are more fatigued. Our willpower is actually so much less than what our parents and grandparents had for willpower because of the fact that we have so much exposure and so many decisions we make, even answering emails, which they never had to do, it's, it, it, it strains us. So we don't have the willpower at the end of the day that they had, which is, I think, why we have an obesity problem. It's just harder to say, I'm going to be strong enough and do what I want to do. And I think that they've taken advantage of that. I think the media, I think that politics and the media have taken advantage of our low willpower because we basically picked up these, these lovely devices and just don't put them down. Um, so I know that at least, all right, if that's true, I can do something about that individually. Mm -hmm. That's a very long answer, by the way. Uh, well, that is a very long answer. You know, but it, it was what I expected from you, but I don't know what yeah. to expect when you give me the answer from BJ Shea, yeah. from yeah. BJ and Miggs in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the answer I will give for BJ and the Migs in the morning, again, again, because of the filter that has to happen, is that I will be very aggressive. So, uh, so uh, <clears throat> look, Graham, uh, you know, I, I, I understand why you're asking that question. I know why you're asking that question. I can tell, what do I think of the guy? If you love the guy, would you ask me that question? No. So right off the bat, I mean, you're going to put me in the corner and go, what do you think of the guy that I hate? And I would ask you, why do you care what I think about Donald Trump? I'm going to ask, what do you think about Donald Trump? Why does my, my opinion even matter to you? Unless, of course, you're looking for me to agree with you and go, yes, he's a horrible person. Or maybe, you know what, maybe you're one of those guys that go, how about that Trump, huh? Knowing that if I don't like him, you're going to hate me. So you can't win with that answer because you know what? Nobody ever really cares what I think. You just want me to agree with what you think. And guess what? I'm not your therapist. I'm not going to answer that question. Go ask somebody who's a paid professional and stop bothering me with politics. Let's talk about something we won't argue over. Brilliant. You are an entertainer through and through, BJ. You are an entertainer. Well, that's, that's very kind coming from you because you know, I actually, I really, really do think highly of you. I, I've always been impressed with you and I've listened, you know, I've listened to a lot of stuff that you've done, Graham. So that's high praise. Thank you. Thank, well, it's high praise coming from you. And I, I thank you for that. I, I really do. It's uh, yeah. Okay. So you grew up in Boston. <laughs> what? You've embarrassed me now. But anyway, you grew up in Boston. Can we talk about how you got into radio then originally? Go right yeah, back I, to the beginning. I uh, way back to the beginning. You know, you're, you know, it's about to be my 60th birthday. You're asking me to remember a lot of years ago. <laughs> That's, uh, I don't know how fair that is. I might need a little time. <laughs> Good thing this is. Oh, you can't see. Oh, you can't, never mind. I'm drinking an invisible drink. This background. Anyway, back to the question. Yeah. Um, Where yes, did you start? How'd you get into that? radio? I didn't know that I was doing radio. As a child, uh, I, uh, I, really, I really was fascinated by entertainment. And, I, uh, and uh, back in the days of cassette recorders, and you could buy these portable cassette recorders, and I would 
tape theme, theme music from all my favorite television shows, I would get a friend of mine and we would act them out uh, and make all of these on one cassette, playing the music from the other cassette. It was very bad. You know, nowadays you have all these great, wonderful editing machines, but this was the uh, DIY version of that. But I didn't know I was doing radio. I was just doing these things, playing it for my friends. We would do Super 8 movies, the 8 millimeter things, and recreate stuff. And uh, I would call into local radio shows to win uh, sporting event tickets. Uh, and uh, I was a young boy, and they never wanted to put you through on these radio talk shows because, you, you know, I've tried to lower my voice as much as possible. Uh, and, but, uh, and I would do these just ridiculous impressions of local celebrities. Uh, and then I found out that if you call into the late, late shows, nobody's listening and calling. So they have to put you through because they have nobody else. You know, <laughs> and so I would call into the late, late shows and hopefully my parents wouldn't know that I was, uh, that I was out of bed. And uh, just before I would get yelled at, I go, Hey dad, I want us two baseball tickets though. How about that? And he'd be like, really? You want two baseball tickets. And you know, then when they would be mailed to me, he'd be like, okay, all right. You know what? Maybe you should stay up a little bit more and try to win us some more sporting event tickets. So, so unlike a lot of people who first get into radio, you were being paid at the very beginning of your career. <laughs> yes, I was. I, I was what they call a prize pig. Right. I, uh, <laughs> I would call every radio station. I was as loyal to anybody that would give me anything. Um, and I, I, um, I, I eventually, I didn't, I thought I was going to be an artist, like a literal cartoonist artist, because in those days, you, you know, people couldn't break your heart and tell you that you couldn't draw. Rather, they would let you take your portfolio around to different colleges and be laughed out of every one of them. And eventually one college just said to me, are you, why are you bringing this anywhere? This is horrible. And I, and I didn't know. I mean, I just thought, well, I mean, my art, my art teacher said I was great. And, um, but I realized that what was and I was told by this one guy. He says, "You know, I'll tell you this. Your cartoon, the the drawings are horrible, but the material is pretty good." He said, "I actually mm -hmm. like the joke." I go, "But it looks like a four year old drew this," uh, and that's when I realized, "Oh, all right. So I am creative. I have to find another outlet." Uh, and then at that, and then I found a, I had to go to college undeclared because you had to go to school. You know, that was the you better go to college. You'll never be anything. Which I'm not sure that's a great message anymore. But I went. And they had a radio station. So I thought, oh, well, this is, I, I like the radio. And the, there was a guy I always loved listening to uh, in Boston uh, who's basically doing what I'm doing right now at the time. And um, who was that? It was Charles Lacordera, um, a great Boston radio personality. He was an actor, couldn't get a job in California, decided uh, radio would help him until he could get to be an actor. And then eventually realized actually radio was a great career and just stayed with it. Um, he has the fame of selling Oprah, one of her homes in Hawaii. Uh, so not only did he have a great radio career, but I have a feeling he made a good value on the home he sold to Oprah. <laughs> um, he was one of the idols I got to meet, um, which was fun because I, I interviewed him early on for when I was at a, a college, at, at college, and I interviewed him. And it was a horrible interview. Uh, he was just like, what, I came with no questions. I was literally that starstruck fanboy. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that Chris Farley piece on Saturday Night Live talking to the Beatles about, well, you play. It was him. And he just looked at me like, what are you doing? Get out of my studio. You'll never be in this business. And I had that all on cassette. It was a funny interview, <laughs> but I, he ruined me. But I played it back for the class. The whole class laughed. The teacher hated it. And I remember the teacher saying, you know what, you, this is the, you, he made you a fool, you were a jerk. And I remember sitting in that class and when he had said that, but I thought, but everybody's laughing. I said, this was successful. Yes, I was the butt of the joke, but it, how, he couldn't have been successful in making everybody entertained. The audience I, liked it and that's yes, who it's if, for. If, if, if I didn't play my part. So I knew then that this teacher who basically was a frustrated broadcaster and had to teach on the side because he just didn't have a great broadcasting career, I realized that's something he doesn't get. He doesn't get that if you're a performer, it doesn't matter if you're the hero or the villain. If people like it, it doesn't matter. And that's what I held on to. I said, this was good. <laughs> you know, I should be better, no doubt about it. I will be a better interviewer. But this was good. And uh, Graham, probably, ooh, I would say 30, 30 years later, during my 10th anniversary here in Seattle, 
they got Charles Laquadera to be on the show with me. Oh, and how cool. As a surprise. And they played the audio for him, uh, <laughs> which this poor man, you know, 40, he, he, this is 40 years or so later, however it was for him. He's, he's in his 60s. He's listening to him be really cruel to me. <laughs> and you could hear his voice. He's just like, oh, oh, you know. And then finally he said, look, I don't know if you knew this, but I had a horrible cocaine addiction back then and I'm so sorry. <laughs> but he ended up being very gracious and kind. And he said, if you're ever in Hawaii, please come visit me. And I took him up on it. I actually yeah. went out there and he, you know what, he, he said, hey, come on over. And we had a great conversation um, and talk about meeting one of your idols. He was the reason I got in the industry. I, I, I loved everything he did. Um, and he was very nice and very gracious because he was, he said, I can't believe that you're making it, you know, this business is even tougher than when I was in it and you have a successful show, good for you. And, and of course it was a show just like he had. So he, he smiled and he said, so yeah, you're really doing just pretty much what I was doing in Boston. I said, yeah, uh, I think you were doing it better, Charles, but yeah, I'm pretty much doing what you were doing in wow. Boston. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's pretty much how I got started. I bounced around the country a lot, um, a lot. My wife is a saint for relocating our young family all those times because I couldn't keep a job. I just, uh, my attitude was not great. I was not great. I wasn't a great worker. I might've been talented. Maybe I was talented, but I was not a great worker. Didn't get along with others. Uh, a lot of stuff up here that I had to figure out eventually, but. So, so what yeah, was it I, that made the difference? Did you, did you have a, an epiphany when you thought, you know, I need to handle this better. Or so was there, was there a thing that, or was there a mentor in particular that sat you down and said, look, kid, you're throwing this all away. This is you, this answer is probably not what you would expect. And yet, I mean, it is the truth. Now, if you were to ask BJ Shea, I would give you a much different answer, but unfortunately you asked me. Yes, you did. Um, and I'm not proud of this, definitely. I, I shouldn't say I'm not proud of it. This is a learning moment in my life. It had nothing to do with my career, uh, Graham. It had to do with the fact that I was a raging, angry, verbally abusive person in those days. And to, to I who, was... People close to you or strangers? Or yes, yes, oh, yes. Uh, uh, the, the closer, yeah, the closer you were, I think the more I was verbally abusive. It, it's one of those, you know, you only hurt the ones you love. Uh, I, it, that surely typified with me. So there was a moment in my life where I don't know why, but I was very, very angry and just had a rage fit, uh, a, a verbally abusive tirade with my wife and my probably seven year old son and four year old daughter and rage, rage, rage. And finally, my wife is like, you need to just go to the bedroom and that's it. I'm not going to let you talk to us this way anymore. Go to the bedroom. I go to the bedroom to cool off. I'm there for an hour, hour and a half, perhaps. And this note is slid under my door. I still have it. I keep it in my wallet with me. It was a defining moment for me. It was, it was a, a, a list of demands by my children. And, you know, Graham, it's written by a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. So stuff that you would put on a refrigerator and that little kid writing. And they were so amazing. I know they were coached by mom because mom's an amazing being, uh, but it was basically, they were like, dad, this is how we want to be treated. We want you to treat us as human beings. We don't want you to yell at us anymore. We know you're hurting. You need to go get help. It was humbling to read how they saw me. And they were, they were brutally honest, these kids. For, for a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, they were able to come out and say, here's what we're seeing. We want to love you and you make it so hard to do so. I sat, I sat in that moment and I was like, wow. I, and so I, had, I wasn't even thinking about my career at that point. I just had to fix that. I could not let those kids grow up with that person. It just, you know, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it to them. Um, and I can't say that I fixed it overnight. It took me decades, but I went into therapy and worked on the rage and the anger and then really became a student of therapy. And luckily that transformed everything. It, 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 it made me a better father and a better husband and a better coworker and a better leader. And I always had great people around me in the business. I just was lost in my own illusion of thinking that the world was against me. I, I, 
it was it's a it's a scary thing to think that i was functionally delusional is really what i was i was seeing windmills as attackers but if you asked me anything else, I would see, I would appear normal. It's like, this is a chair, this is a desk, this is a computer, and that windmill is gonna kill me. Mm. That's the thing with functional delusion is that you seem normal because you're getting probably 80% of it, 90% of it right, but that 10 to 20% is what's making you a danger. And I don't know, you know, I, I'm just an average person. I shudder to think if the rest of the world is functionally delusional. I know that I run into people and I see myself. I'm like, oh, I remember this. When I see somebody you know, railing against something or whatever, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is me. I remember me being like this. Um, so getting clear, realizing that I wasn't being attacked by windmills meant that I didn't always have to respond with aggression because I just always felt I was defending what, myself. What kind of thing, how did the windmills show themselves? What kind of things were they, the triggers? Well, you know, the, the, the tr is, and Graham, the triggers are insane. You, if there's um, words that were said by people, by somebody reminding me of a childhood trauma, but I don't know that. If I don't go exploring, if somebody looks like my father perhaps or my mother, or if one of my bosses looks that way, or if there's a certain noise or scream, things that took me back to places that I didn't know, my body's having this physical reaction of fight or flight. My mind is like, we are in fight or flight. Would you like me to, we need to find out what the source of the problem is. My mind kept looking at right now. The problem is, is it wasn't right now. It was right. from way back, but my mind doesn't know that. My mind is like, look, we gotta figure, we gotta stop this. You're, you're in trouble, what are we gonna do? Ah, it's that person over there. Let's, let's engage and protect ourselves. And eventually I had this, Start saying, no, wait a second. What's really going on here? Um, I read a great book called Brain Rules by Dr. John Medina. And he said, basically, we are in a state of such fight or flight that it reminds us of when we were back in the Serengeti and we were running from our lives because we were about to be eaten. He said, but nobody is in that position anymore. And yet some of us are in that state as if, in fact, you are running from a predator, which mm -hmm. is unbelievable that we our bodies are in that state sometimes when he'd be like we have the ability to get to that state because well there was a time where we were running for predators and we shouldn't be eating and our body's like dude we're in trouble get the blank out of here yeah um, it's interesting because we, when you're in that that state that the blood diverts to the muscles of the arms and legs and it takes away um, blood and oxygen and whatever from the the higher reasoning of the brain because you don't need that to just run you need this to run and you need your higher reasoning when you're in a, a, a situation where you know especially if it's a boss or somebody you love you need higher reasoning to deal with complex issues you don't need to be Captain Caveman which is what you become when you're in the fight or flight state and uh, it's the reason why you know I've I'm sure everybody's had it you have a, a, a stupid argument with a boss or somebody close, and then later when you're driving home, you think, why didn't I just say this? And then he would have understood. And it's because your higher reasoning was literally shut down at the time. And so, wow, yeah, so, yeah. So, but you had an extreme version of, of something that everybody has, but you had a, a, an unhealthy version of it. I, you know, Graham, I tell everybody that uh, because I believe currently because of COVID that people are in that state because COVID is definitely something where it could kill you. It's scary. So it's reasonable then to be anxious and even, and what people don't understand and behavioral scientists have said this, uh, and it's not my, my words, but they have said this in, in, unfortunately the media doesn't cover it that much, but behavioral scientists, they've been saying we are all in a state of high anxiety, which is why when people are acting a certain way, you'd be like, why are they doing that? It's for the very reason you said, their higher reasoning is gone because they think they're going to die mm. because of this high state of anxiety, which is really something that I, I think is so important for, uh, for me to understand as a human being that if I see somebody behaving badly or somebody doing whatever, that I have to remember, oh yeah, because I used to be that way. The difference was is that everybody looked at me like, what are you doing? Now everybody's me from all those years ago. I actually have some experience in this because I was operating like this, you know, for my own reasons of thinking that my life was in peril. 
uh, but it was delusional. The thing is now it's not delusional. And so I, but I have great empathy because I know what this high anxiety state is, but I was forced to learn because my therapist was a really wonderful therapist. He said, I don't try to tell people that they have something wrong. Cause there are some therapies, therapists who will just go and diagnose you and say, well, you have this and you have this, so you should stop doing this. His attitude was, if you believe you were in peril, you are, you are in the same state of somebody who's in peril. And therefore I need to approach you as if you really were in peril. And I, that approach helped out a lot. He approached me as a person that was in trauma because I was in his mind. And then he was able to nurture me and, and calm me down. And eventually over the decades, teach me how to do that. So that when you talk about the higher reasoning being gone and the muscles ready to go and everything going like that, he taught me also to have another voice show up and say, hey, 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 are you really, are you really in danger right now? And with the other voice saying, yes, I am. Are we really though? I think that's a good, up? that's a key point. I know me personally, I'm not, you know, nowhere near those kind of issues, but the, the way I try to deal with it in those situations is to ask myself a question. And you did, you said, are you really, and I'll usually ask something, something along the lines of, how do I really want to come across here to this person? And just asking that question turns on some of the higher reasoning of the brain because the brain hates not knowing the answer and, and, and questions make it, um, yeah. So there's a little survival technique for anyone who's dealing with it on a milder level than what you had to go through. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's a lot of discipline for me too. But it's, it's, it's helped out my career. Right? That was really what turned my career around was that moment with my kids. Yeah. Um, wow. and, then, and, then I was, and then I realized a lot of great performers actually have had some sort of, you know, it's interesting. In the West, we call it therapy and it's got a bad name. In the East, it's self-inquiry and all the great yogis have done it. And it's actually quite revered, but it's the same process. Uh, and that is basically just looking with inside and so, and, and basically out in self-realization, that's what therapy is. But unfortunately the West is, especially if you're a man, I don't, what, what, what? No, no, I will. I don't, I don't need mental help. Get out of here. I suppose uh, it doesn't help as well in the West these days that everybody's, well, you're from Seattle. So, you know, coffee and energy drinks and stimulants and whatever, it's just not going to help. I mean, are you still off the caffeine? Um, I, I actually never was off. Uh, well, I'm trying to think, you know, because you may have remembered that time where I was forced off caffeine by my own crew. You, you, uh, to, you told me at one stage that you, you were, well, you were drinking decaf and I went, oh, you drink decaf. And you, you told me it was something to do with caffeine being yeah. really bad for you in particular. That there are certain yes, people run, it doesn't agree with. I run high. I, I'm, I'm, my, uh, I'm a, I, they, they call it cyclothymic and I naturally, it's like I have natural, natural cocaine in my system. So when some people really need to pick me up in order to do anything, I don't need that. I, I really run pretty high. Like I've already done a radio show. I've been up since four in the morning and yet my body right now is juiced and all I have is water. My <laughs> system just naturally does that which is a beautiful thing for what I want to do for a living. But it, the trouble is, is that powering down is important because cyclothymia is bipolar's friendly cousin. It can be managed without medication and it doesn't give you the massive highs or the massive lows, but I get higher highs than the average person and I get lower lows than the average person, but I can manage it. And that all just, it's just all just based on discipline. Caffeine, full blown caffeine, I mean, imagine somebody on a Coke binge, if you give me a Coca-Cola, just one, give me a regular cup of coffee. Uh, so, cause decaf is not caffeine free. It's just less caffeine. Yeah. A decaf will bounce me off the walls. Whereas <laughs> caffeine, you know, you'd probably be, yeah, you would probably not even be able to follow me in the interview. I'd be talking at a hundred miles or a hundred kilometers per hour. Whatever that, whatever that translates, it's a lot. You know, I'd be, and I'm, already kind of doing that now and i all i have is water yeah yeah uh, okay and, well yeah, as you said though so, for the line of work you're in it's a handy thing to have if you've got to get up at four o'clock in the morning and be sharp you know every day of the week yeah and you know graham you know being in the entertainment business like we are how many people use artificial stimulants to get there i mean yeah. coffee's the milder one but in the, in the 80s, Bright Lights, Big City, cocaine was every stand-up comedian that I, I used to do stand-up comedy. 
every one of them. It was insane. They would get a little help from the powder. And I would watch them and think, wow, I don't understand why. And I never had a desire to do so. And then eventually somebody pulled me aside and said, you don't need any. Okay, that's why. I said, you're, you're crazy just being you. And I thought, oh, all right. Well, I guess that makes sense. Um, I spoke yeah. to Jonathan Brandmeier in Chicago a couple of weeks oh, ago. And, great uh, talent. He, he was. He talks about there was a situation where there was, there was uh, there was cocaine available, and I think it was Buzz, his newsman, said, "Do not give Jonathan Brandmeier coke," and he never went near it, and he, and he, and he hasn't touched it. But yeah, there are certain people you don't need it. Yeah, it's so true. I, I, I I've seen I've seen him at conventions, and of course his career is legendary. And at conventions, it's amazing how aware and how much spark he has. Mm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me because you know, a person like that, you, you'd explode. You know, I mean, it's just you know the normal person. It brings you up a little bit, makes <laughs> everything seem fun. I think I would explode. I think it would just spontaneous combustion would happen. I, I think just talking to you makes people. I mean, I'm I feel more awake now than I did at the beginning of this interview. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that. It's it's an infectious thing you've got, BJ. It's well, a natural. Thank you. I know you work very very hard, but there isn't there is a natural a buzz you get from just being around you and hanging out with you that, that I've got through uh -huh. this interview. And, and so thank you very much for that. It's great to catch up with you again. It really is. We'll, we'll have to see each other again soon. I don't know when it'll be. I hope it won't be uh, as many years as it was between. Uh, well, who knows with this damn virus when we can actually all get. So to true. It. Yeah. So the podcast. Well, is... and, and... Sorry, mate. Yes. No, I was, well, well, I was wrapping I was... it up. But if there's stuff you want to get in, you better get it in there. Because you're going to regret oh, no. it in your higher reasoning. No, I, uh, I was just going to give you platitudes back uh, because I've always, I've always found you a very, very uh, per wonderful person to, to spend time with. Uh, pr probably because of the fact you might be the uh, yin to my yang or the, or, or the yang to my ying. Uh, because I've always found you to be very pleasant, uh, grounding, uh, someone that just, no matter what was going on, it was always going to seem to be okay when I was around you. Is sort of like what I get from, uh, you know, being in your presence. So it seems like it's a good, you know, uh, symbiotic thing, perhaps. Yeah, going good. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much for saying that, BJ. The podcast is called BJ Shea's Geek Nation. It's yes. available wherever you get them. Is there a podcast of the of the radio show as well, or do you make them just? Yes, listen? Uh, it's it's BJ and Migs. If you go to radio dot com, yeah, and just put in BJ Shea, you'll get everything. It, it, that's the probably the easiest way to go. Plus, my company would love it if I said radio dot com because uh, that's what they're doing. They're, that's their umbrella where everything is under protecting us from the elements. Uh, so we, we'll say that's where you can get it. Radio.com, BJ Shays Geek Nation, BJ and Migs. Uh, don't go on the internet and just type in that randomly. No, 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 no. Those initials. Be, yeah, a little bit that's different. That's a tough one. Uh, not safe for work. Uh, I, don't, I don't want any of the nice people that you know all of a sudden being brought in for questioning. Uh, you know, it's tough enough to get employed without typing in the wrong thing on the internet. That's for sure. Uh, BJ Shea, it's been a pleasure as always. Thanks a lot, mate. Mm. Hopefully, so good. We'll see you so really good. good. Really My good pleasure. to talk to you. You're probably ready for a lie down now. Uh, well, you'd be surprised. I think I'm probably going to go take a hike. I think I'm going to get a little okay. exercise. I got this energy. I got to burn it off, man. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's wonderful talking to a good friend and uh, someone I have a lot of love for. So uh, thanks for thinking of me. It's quite an honor because, I mean, you've talked to some great people and the fact that you put me on that list is, is, is special to me. Thank you. You're on that list, PJ. No doubt about yeah. it. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.